And now, the star of the show, Jordan Rogozinski. Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Jordan 411 Sports Show. And today, I'm very honored that he would take the time. And I would like to thank the Winnipeg Jets for giving his time. Uh, and he's the assistant GM for the Winnipeg Jets. Please give a warm welcome to Craig Heisinger. Thank you, Frank, Thank for you. being on my show. And my first question is, for those of us that don't know what uh, your job entails, can you uh, explain it? I certainly can, but first of all, going back to what you said originally, don't tell the Jets I'm here because I never told them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My job as assistant GM, um, well, it in entails a lot of different things from, from the Jets to the Moose. Uh, a lot of it is on a day-to-day -day basis interacting with the coaches on both teams, the players on both teams. Um, both teams have team services guys that, that run the day-to-day -day travel of the team, so you deal with them uh, every morning, uh, either be it Moose practice or Jets practice with, when you're in town. Um, scouting, amateur scouting is a large component of my job which takes a lot of travel very involved in the draft process which means creating a 120 player list over the over the course of a season I couldn't imagine how long that takes yeah it takes a while but you're not doing it by yourself you yeah. we have a scouting department of 13 guys um, that as part of my job I'm just part of that group I'm in the scouting side I'm not the assistant GM or vice president or anything I'm, I'm one of the the crossover scouts that's responsible yeah. so if if you get a good pick you get accolades but if you get a bad pick you get criticized like Patrick La Laine was a good picker for our second pick in the 2016 draft was a good pick for for you guys I don't think even we could have screwed that up yeah um, um, I mean at, but at, at the end of the day the truth yeah. be known Patrick wasn't always number two on our list. There were some good players uh, that year. I think I think Austin Matthews was the consensus yeah. number one pick. But certainly, um, if if you look at the players from that draft year, uh, Jesse Puglia Harvey was a good good player, and we had lots of time for him. Matthew Kachuk. There's been some there's been some good players, and I think if you if you look after Patrick Line, I think uh, uh, Matthew Kachuk went six, but you could probably make the argument that he probably would have gone third. How does your scouting assignment work then? Like, let's say you get a player. Do you send somebody out to go look at a player? It works year over year. Um, players don't become eligible until they turn 17. Um, so you have reports filed from, from the year before on underage players. But we have 13 amateur scouts, and they work in various regions. Like we have... We have three guys that cover the Western League. We have one guy that covers the OHL. We have one guy that covers the Quebec Major Junior League. Two guys that cover the USHL. We have three full-time guys in Europe oh. that cover our, our head European guy lives in St. Petersburg, Russia. We have a Swedish scout that lives in, uh, in Frolunda and uh, a Czech guy that lives just outside of Prague. And you control all these guys? We have a head, uh, we have a director of amateur scouting. His name is Mark Hillier. Okay. He would direct those guys. I would oversee the amateur scouting side, but, but in that group, he oversees it. And we have four crossover guys that see everybody. So area guys don't see all your, all, all the, you split the players into A, B, and C plus and C prospects. So the key for the crossover guys, which are your head guys that are ultimately probably at the end of the day responsible, but it's a it's a team group. But the crossover guys see everybody. So Mark Hillier, who's the director of amateur scouting, myself, a guy named Brian Renfrew, and a guy named Scott Scoville. Um, we all four of us would see all the players that finish up on our 120 man list. Do you scout more than 120? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like over, so it's the end of November now. I've seen, uh, I just did my internet reports there yesterday or 
the day before. I think I've seen me personally, so if you, I guess you could times it by 13 because everybody's pretty much in the same boat for the end of November. I've seen 85 players and done 373 reports. Holy. So it's only the end of November. So you, you see a lot of players and a lot of games. Most full-time amateur scouts would see in the, in the average of between 185 and 220 games a year. Um, how does like uh, your chief work then when you div when you're looking at a player when you were writing notes on a player like what do you look for do you have a certain checklist? Yeah, we have a checklist. I mean, in t in today's game, the keys you're looking for are skating, compete, hockey sense. That's that's for us. But I, I think generally when you talk about today's game, if you can't skate, you can't play. Yeah. So that's that's certainly a starting point, but you can't skate a million miles an hour and not no. be able to think the game. No. So there's there's a variety of things, but we, we, we have a checklist and a, and a one through 10 designation that, that you designate like how the game was, how the player skating is, how his hockey sense is, what his athleticism is, those, those type of things, character and compete. Do you ever disagree on who who you should pick like when you're scouting? Absolutely we do. And I think that's the key to I think that's the key to doing a good job scouting is is that you don't always agree. Everybody sees players a different way and, and it happens all the time. Like you'll go to the game, sometimes it'll be if I'm there with another one of our scouts or two other scouts and you go to watch a, a B a B player um, which is a guy you would take in the say the second or the third round and all three guys might see how the guy played totally different and maybe if maybe you don't disagree on how he played but one guy will have a skating at a seven one guy will have it at a five and one guy will have it at a four and if you're if you're a four skater you clearly can't play okay. if you're a five skater you might be you might have a chance if you're six it's above like average fourth line or well no it's it's it, it's yeah. it's it's a it's a it's just a scale to, to see where the guy skating would oh, be. Okay. Yeah, and you would uh, when you when you talk about uh, fourth fourth line or second line or whatever. Yeah, you identify guys that you might say, well, this guy's upside is third line tops. Yeah. Like he's good, he's big, he skates, he's he's physical on the forecheck, he's good on faceoffs, but his finish isn't all all, all that great. Like yeah. he doesn't have, say, Kyle Connor type skill. Yeah. Um, for the for the Winnipeg Jets fans, can you explain how you find Mark Shifley, please? Yeah, well then, who else is going to be watching the show? We don't want anybody else finding the other Mark Shifley that's out there. <laughs> no. Well, I think he's the only one. Yeah. No, but I know, hope so. You know what? I mean, it's interesting, Mark Shifley, that was, he was the first pick when when we, when we returned, uh, or when Atlanta relocated to uh, Winnipeg, the things that stick out for me about Mark Shifley that draft year is we weren't overly involved in, the, in, the, in that draft. I would say like, you know, myself and Chevy because we had just taken over the team. But they had a, um, we probably have not, uh, a, maybe a couple more than half of the scouts that worked for Atlanta still work for us now. We obviously made some changes. But they were passionate about Mark Shifley. I can't tell you that that we knew a, a lot about Mike, Mark Shifley, but I know when we picked him, we were roundly criticized for picking him because yeah. he was very much under the under the radar and there were some higher profile guys like Sean Couturier and stuff that people wow. felt should go, uh, go, uh, go uh, ahead of him. But at the end of the day, I think, um, I think our scouts were right and we got the right player. Yeah, I would agree. How about when he was sent down to Go play with the move three times. Well, I think... How does that process work? Well, that process works in a variety of different ways. First of all, he when he went down and played for the Moose the first time, he played 10, 10 games and had one point. So, as I, mentioned in, uh, as I mentioned in the previous talk there with the uh, Project 11 stuff, the media had pretty much determined him a, a bust by then. And then we sent him back to junior two times as well. Oh, yeah. But you, nobody's, I, I mean, I'm a firm believer that nobody's career was ever ruined by playing too much time in junior or no. playing too much time in the American League. I think careers do get ruined by playing too soon in the NHL yeah. 
or when you're 18 years old and you're drafted as a skilled player but they decide to keep you and you play third and fourth line and you get turned into a checker instead of what you were drafted for and that's to be an offensive guy. So the idea is to be the best player you can be at the level you should be playing in at that period of time. And we thought those levels for Mark were good. Uh, we thought, would have thought he'd had more success in the American League than he did, but he went back to junior bowl times and, and lit it up and gained his confidence yeah. and the process has proven to be semi-successful. Yeah. And for those of us that don't know like how you like how you travel, can you explain that story? Like where you travel and that? Like do you travel like a, a around the world? Travel around the world, yes. Um, just came back from uh, uh, two weeks in Europe um, I didn't. The team, the team obviously played two games over there in, in Finland, which um, I was still needed to go to Europe anyway. But, but for instance, uh, they went uh, after the Toronto game, which I think was the 27th or the 28th. I didn't need the European vacation time that those guys needed. I went on the 30th of of uh, I left Winnipeg on the 30th of uh, October. Got to Helsinki at 2:30 that afternoon went to a league game that night at 6.30 in the Finnish Elite League, went to the Jets game in Helsinki on November 1st and 2nd, was in Germany in uh, Mannheim on, uh, on the Saturday and the Sunday, went from, flew from Mannheim back to Vienna to drive to the Czech Republic, um, was Holy. in uh, Bruno, Prague and somewhere else in the Czech Republic for those three or four days for the under 18 tournament then went to the under 20 tournament in uh, I can't remember but I travel but I travel a lot but not just in Europe I mean like t what's today we're doing this show with you on Monday tomorrow's Tuesday I'll work in the office uh, pretty much all day. I'll leave around four o'clock to drive to Roseau, Minnesota for a high school game, which is two hours and 15 minutes from Winnipeg. Come back tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday, I'll get on a plane at one o'clock to go to San Diego to get to the Moose game that night in all San right. Diego. Uh, go to the Bakersfield, Ontario game in the American League Thursday morning at 10.30 a.m., which is a school game. Fly from San Diego to Seattle on Friday for the junior game at night. Drive from Seattle to Portland on Saturday for the junior game there. Drive from Portland to S Vancouver on Sunday for the junior game in Vancouver. And then fly back to California on Monday to reconnect with the Moose. I know it's your job, but that was like 10 minutes of travel. Did that ever weigh on you? Uh, yeah, it weighs yeah. on me just talking about it. Like it, uh, yeah. I mean, people think it's it's. Uh, um, I don't know. I, I don't know what people think sometimes, but people, people think, think it's easy. Yeah, yeah. People think it's easy. That's well said, or it's glamorous, or, or yeah. whatever. Like, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not really sure what to say. It's it. It, it weighs on you. Th those are good words. That, the travel weighs on you for sure. How about your family? Does it weigh on them at all? Yeah, it, it, it does, and um, yeah, it, it weighs it weighs on them for sure. Um, and you deal with different. Everyone deals with different issues with their family, and and um, yeah, I think I, I think I have a a situation in my family that's been affected by the amount that that I've traveled, especially the last seven years since since the Jets returned and. And maybe it, it, it took something that happened to me personally and my family personally to give me a wake up call that these ridiculous trips need to be cut back or at least split yeah. up. Um, you were talking about the trip to Finland. How was that experience for the whole organization? Well, I think that remains to be seen because the one thing those trips do, with well, all the one thing it does, it lit a fire under Patrick Liney's ass because <laughs> um, he had three goals going into that trip and now he's got 19. So from that perspective, it was probably good. From an overall scheduling perspective, I'm not sure how it will play out because um, those trips suck a lot of usable days yeah. out of the schedule. Um, so we played two games in a 10-day period there 
and four days of it on each side were, a, were acclimatization. When you got to Europe and then reacclimatization when you got back to North America. So those are eight good days where you probably don't play four games in that period of time and those four games got to fit somewhere else in an already condensed schedule. Um, I think it was Adam Lowry that was having trouble adjusting. Do you ever have trouble adjusting with how much you travel in the time zones? No, I would tell you no. My, in my previous life and a more enjoyable life, I was an equipment guy and I was an equipment guy for a long time in junior and then with Jets 1.0 and then with Moose 1.0. Um, and I think when you're a trainer, you learn a couple things. You learn to sleep when it's possible. You learn to sleep on planes and buses. So for me, um, no, I, I, can, I can fly, as long as I fly at night, uh, between 6.30 and 10.30, leave Toronto, say between 6.30 and 10.30 at night, and wake up in Europe uh, off the plane and it's morning, it's a, it's a normal day for me. Um, and I can go to games right away. So. No, I, I don't have any, any, any problem acclimatizing to European travel. Uh, could you see that being an issue though for some players that haven't done it before? Well, I guess the sympathetic answer would be yes, but the way the players travel on charters, uh, gourmet food, beds on the planes type thing, I guess if I want to be sympathetic, okay, yeah, okay, it's tough on them. But the fact of the matter is, the worst thing that really goes wrong for him is the shrimp is a little soggy. You were talking about the food. What kind of food did they get on the plane? Well, it's not the kind that you and I get in coach, I can tell <laughs> yeah. you that. Um, I mean, the way that ch the charters work is we, 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 we charter with Air, Air Canada jets. And I mean, um, most of the catering is from, from restaurants versus, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not airport catering. It's mm -hmm. You know, you'd go to, I don't, I don't know, like lots of the visiting teams when they come to fly out, fly out from Winnipeg, they would get maybe five two nine catered or highs catered or, okay. I mean, Earl's is a popular uh, one. Pl yeah, and not that it's overly high end, but good food, good food there, and, it, and it's consistent. Um, but like, there's, you know, the NHL. You know, there's lots of things, gets jokes made that it's the Never Hungry League. Like, there's, there's, there's food yeah. all the time. Like, I play flag hockey, and I've been uh, fortunate to see your, one of your trays come up with food. There's a lot of food on there, and yeah. I'm very good. You're right. I mean, the, the players don't, the players in today's professional environment, don't do without very much and nutrition's a big f part of it there's there's no doubt about that Pe teams have sleep doctors nutrition guys um sports psychologists all those type of things so and not only do teams have them um, players players employ them directly just for themselves i mean you mentioned it, there's players that have their own private chefs for the sun for the winter yeah. that, that that cook for yeah, them so like. they're their nutrition is what they need it to be. They, yeah. You can look at it two ways. You can look at it as being a bit, bit, bit elitist, but you can also look at it as investing in themselves. So all the work they put in, like, like I'm talking workout, practice, and games, uh, what's, I know the angle of the cup, but what's a, what's a like, good season to you guys? Like, I know the angle is always the cup, but what's a, a goal for you guys every year? Well, I think, I, think the goal, I think the goal at the National Hockey League level is always to win the Stanley Cup, but there's, there's some years that, that you say that, but it's, it's not realistic or yeah. it's not attainable. Like when I, we first got here, right. for example. Yeah, that, that wasn't attainable. I think the goals of that, those years were to make the playoffs. Yeah. But we said that we were going to be a draft and develop team and it was going to take between five and, year, five and seven years to get there. And now I think from a, from a Jets perspective that a successful season is defined by getting to the finals and or winning the cup. Yeah. But organizationally, there's three levels to our organization. There's the Jets, there's the Moose, and there's our East Coast League team in Jacksonville, Florida. And everybody's 
goal is different. Like, as I said, the Jets' success is measured on on wins and losses and Stanley Cups, where in the American League, it's wins and losses are important, but development of the young players is important. The fact that, that those young guys improve, they get minutes, they get called up, they're able to contribute at the National League level. And the same as can be said about Jacksonville and the ECHL, that those guys get, they get time, they get minutes. Um, it's a, we have a really good goalie prospect down there, uh, Mikel Burden, who's having a lot of success. I mean, you don't get better without playing and you don't get better unless everybody in the organization's on the same page. And so you and we, we employ the coaches at all three levels to ensure that the players that we need to get played get played, but they have to earn that ice time. So is the next level from that Jacksonville franchise than the Moose? Yes, we yeah. The, the the natural progression from Jacksonville is you come up to the Moose. So, for instance, um, the Moose got two defensemen injured on the weekend: Tucker Pullman and Luke Green, who will be out both between uh, I don't know a week to three weeks. So we call up two contracted players from Jacksonville, in uh, Jacob Cedar Holman and uh, Justin Woods. To replace those guys, okay. so so that's how it works. And if we have we have two goalies down there, not all the players in Jacksonville are our own players, but six or eight of them are. Who calls the players up? Um, it depends. Uh, in certain situations, there's going to be a player uh, recalled to the Jets today after five o'clock, or after four o'clock Central Time, which is five o'clock Eastern. Um, and uh, Pascal Vincent will call him. Okay. The circumstances, the, the circumstances daily are different on how recalls take place. It's not always the same person, and sometimes different coaches like it to handle it in different ways. Like in uh, at the, in the early Moose days, and when we were in St. John's, the Keith McCambridge was the coach there. He always wanted me to call the player for recalls. I always think it should be the coach that calls the players for recall because he's the one that controls the ice time and, and helps yeah. you with your success. And uh, for the most part, Pascal calls the, the players that get recalled now. And if we recall a player from Jacksonville to the Moose, the coach, Jason Christie, in Jacksonville will call the player and say, you're going up. Can you tell me about a little bit about Project 11, please? Well, I was really happy to be at your school today to talk about Project 11. Project 11 is a, is a legacy program created in memory of a friend of mine, Rick Rippon, who played for the Manitoba Moose, uh, the Vancouver Canucks, and signed with the Winnipeg Jets when they returned in 2011, but tragically never got the opportunity to play. Uh, Rick suffered from mental illness, uh, anxiety, and depression. And on 2011, or in 2011, August 15, 2011, uh, took his own life. But his goal uh, on the road to recovery was to be able to help kids, uh, at least uh, for the most part, middle school kids, um, was his goal. But now, Project 11, we've just started uh, our pilot teaching from kindergarten to grade four. So now we're gonna be in the province of Manitoba uh, from kindergarten all the way to grade eight. We're in over 450 classrooms um, as of today in the province. And we touch over 15,000 students over the course of the year. And that's our goal uh, is to stay within the province. We've had lots of interest outside the province and we've resisted that to this point. However, uh, very quietly, Project 11 is alive and well in the province of New Brunswick. Um, from a lady whose daughter took her own life at the same time Rick did, and she reached out to us with a very compelling and impassionate story. And uh, Project 11 in, uh, is in the province of, of New Brunswick, but uh, d has, <clears throat> certainly has an impact there, but doesn't touch as many kids as we touch in the province here. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming on my show today. My pleasure. It was a pleasure and good knowledge, by the way. I'm sure most Jet fans wouldn't have got the insight that you were giving me. So thank you for doing that. And thank you guys for being a good audience and uh, listening. And yeah, and goodbye, folks. Yeah, you can.
gonna talk for hours.